So, good afternoon if you are somewhere in the east coast of the United States or South America. Good evening if you are in Bayreuth, for example. Good overnight if you are somewhere else in the world. And good day if you're in Australia. I'm very happy to have my first Australian guest on Fred Plotkin on Fridays. This is Fred Plotkin on Fridays on Adagio, the place where classical music happens. As you well know, Adagio is a video and audio streaming platform dedicated to supporting artists and to making classical music and opera available to fans all over the world. When I say all over the world, I mean all over the world. My guest today is Daniel Sumegi, who got up early on Saturday, November 11th, to join me so I could record this program um, a little bit ahead of time, just slightly ahead of time, so that viewers can see him all around the world. Daniel, welcome. Thank you for having me. So is that white beard that you're growing, is that to play Votan, or did you have it before? I have, for most of my career, had a beard. And as one gets older, one dispenses with the hair dye. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) So I have my white beard now because I'm old enough to say, hey, I can own that. And... I'll just go with age. Well, in a way, it it was a serious question because men who sing a lot of bass baritone roles, especially if they do a lot of Wagner, seem to be called upon to have beards. I remember, for example, Sir Donald McIntyre had a beard for much of his career. John Tomlinson had a beard for much of his career. These men who have played the great Wagner roles and a few Verdi roles as well, have tended to have white beards. Have you ever done Osmin in the Enfurung aus dem Serai from Mozart? I have only done one performance of that as a very young singer. Uh, Actually, I'm in Brisbane, Australia now for our new ring cycle. And it was one of my very early contracts with the opera company that was and is still here, the local one. And I was the understudy for that role. And we did a student matinee in English. Wonderful. Uh, The reason I ask is because I think a category can come up on opera quizzes of white beard roles, of which you are an exponent. Um, You we're going to talk about this at length. You are about to embark on playing your first Votan and Wanderer in the ring cycle that's being done at Brisbane. But in studying up for this conversation, I discovered that I don't think I've ever seen an artist with a wider range of roles and styles and places that you have sung in your career, which began in 1988. Um, it's You are truly an international artist. You are an Australian, but I mean, you sung everywhere. Uh, well, almost, yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, the question that it inevitably leads to is that audiences are different in many places. Operatic styles are very different. You will know your role, but you'll be called upon to be in very different kinds of productions, performing in front of audiences, let's say in Germany or New York, who may be very familiar with certain repertory. But let's say you're doing Wagner in Singapore, as I know you've done. Um what is that like to sing in front of an audience that may not be as prepared as an audience in Germany or New York? Well, in Singapore, it was very interesting because the audience was very young and no one there had, this was the premiere of that work. It was Die Valkyra. It was the premiere of that work in that country. Hmm. Um, And they were extremely enthusiastic, I have to say. Um, But, you know, Wagner audiences are extremely enthusiastic everywhere for different reasons. Um, These were newcomers to it, but the hard and fast died in the wool fans are enthusiastic for other reasons, and the enthusiasm may not always be positive. So Mm -hmm. (laughs) Wagner Wagner audiences somehow claim some kind of ownership over over the work. 
and it's almost like a blood sport. So in Singapore, it was very friendly. I I hear you completely on it's being a blood sport, but in my experience working in opera houses and wood singers doing Wagner, there's a certain kind of fraternity, sorority, solidarity among Wagner performers that one does not necessarily find in performers of other composers. It's as if you're part of something bigger, maybe. Um, yes, it's it's. I, I find that the generally speaking, uh, a classical music or an opera audience uh, percentage of a population. I think runs at about one to two percent of a population base mm-hmm. of any area, and the Wagner aficionados are about one percent of that. So it's very yeah. tiny and very very territorial. Um, I made a list for myself of some of the roles I was able to find that you have sung, but I I'm just going to say an opera, and you tell me what roles you did because I think you've done a lot of different Wagner operas. Parsifal. I was. A Klingzor, and I covered have covered Gurnemans. Gurnemans, Gurnemans being, if I remember, the longest role in the opera. It's an incredibly long role. You know, it might be, but it's not as long as it seems. <laughs> <laughs> he, basically, he sings for two thirty-minute sections: one mm-hmm. in Act One, one in Act Three. Yeah, and Wagner is amazing in the way he makes. I'm not saying Gurnemans is a small role. It's a very, for a bass, it's a very long role. Uh, But with other roles, for example, like Hornding or roles such as that, or even Parsifal, the role of Parsifal, he makes quite short roles seem immense. Now, I don't know what sort of trick he did to do that. It's just probably the scale of the music. Um, but Gurnemans is one of the longer roles, but it's not by any means the longest role in uh, that genre. But in that opera, yes, it po- possibly is the longest role. And he has some glorious music. He does indeed. I think he's an undervalued uh, character in, in all of opera. He's a character I feel very deeply for. He's He's a bit outside the story in a way, but he's the one who leads us to the story and the one who if he feels what's happening to the people around him. Well, he kind of, I suppose, acts like a one-man Greek chorus or narrator, right? Yeah. So, um, and I'm always, it's a role that I always watch and care about a lot. In Tannhäuser, what have you sung? Uh, in Tannhäuser, I have sung both the Landgraf and Bitterolf. hmm Yes. And the Landgraf is the one who... It's his castle, basically. <laughs> and it's good to be the king. It's good to be the king. And the singing competition happens there. I mentioned that it's I mean, if I had to say a favorite Wagner opera, it would be Tannhäuser, but I love almost all of them. Um, but there's just something about what happens to the central characters, but also the smaller characters. Many people criticize the opera Tannhäuser as being overly sexy, overly overwrought. I find it deeply meaningful because it's, a, to me, about a man in this case, but it could be a woman in society and then outside of society, where we fit, how we are judged, what the standards are by which we're judged. And I find it deeply, deeply moving when I see a good performance of Tannhäuser. Well, looking at it through that lens, it's it's very uh, relevant and and of today, isn't it, or of any day? And um, yes, you would if you don't look at it just simply as an old sort sort of fairy tale story. True. To me, it's never been that. To me, Elizabeth is a person. Wagner women in general, but Elizabeth in particular, along with Brunhilde, are the two women in Wagner for me who grow the most, who learn the most, who take responsibility for what they've learned, and react in their different ways. Uh, Senta in The Flying Dutchman does not learn all that much. She's impulsive and, and you know, God bless her for doing that. But there's something about Elizabeth's choices, and she's only 18, that are very powerful to me and, and what she will do for another person and what this flawed man of Tannhäuser does. 
and the way the Landgrave is there as an observer and has to uphold law on one hand, he's a bit like Wotan, but on the other hand, sees something more that is outside the laws of the society. Yeah. 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 Um, in Lohengrin, what did you play? Uh, I, uh, uh, King Henry. I King Henry. King. Yes. yes. Which I've is only, another. Yes. He's the most, apart from these Votans, that's the most recent one I've done. Mm -hmm. Where yeah. did you do it? I did it in Melbourne uh, for Opera Australia with Jonas Kaufmann. Not bad. And, and then I covered it at the Met this year. Mm -hmm. uh, where we had the wonderful Piotr Betzawa. Yes. Who, who I, I went to about five of those. Lohengrin to me is probably the Wagner opera I've seen most. When I teach it, I usually put it in the context of it's being about belief. And belief is a word that can cut across many ways, whether it's religion, whether it's trust of another human being. Um, the way Elsa feels she must believe but can't believe. And the way doubt enters her thinking and undoes what could be her, her happy fate. Um, and also, do we believe at the end that she dies or does not die, that the swan has turned into a little boy? All these things, we really have to, it's an act of faith, is that opera. Yes. With, with gorgeous, gorgeous music. In Meister Zinger, what have you sung? I have sung Pogna, mm -hmm. uh, Times, and Hermann Ortel. Okay. Yes. And Tristan and Isolde? Uh, Courvenal. Corvinal. Ah, um, hang on. I also did cover once at the Met. Mark? King Mark. Mark, King Mark. yeah. Um, for many people, their favorite opera of all. Uh, I recognize this magnificence musically, but I I warm up more to Tannhäuser, Lohengrin, and the Ring Cycle. You've sung Daland in The Flying Dutchman, yes? Many times. Many, many times. Tell I've me about him. I've also sung the Dutchman. You've sung the Dutchman. So tell me about both of those men from your view. Oh, well, Dalant is an opportunist. He's a businessman, you know, simple. Mm -hmm. And he sees an opportunity to <laughs> offload his daughter. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's pretty just uh, transactional. Yeah. And in a way, the Dutchman is transactional too. He's looking for a, 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 an escape clause from his curse. Um, and in that way, the story boils down fairly simply. I think a lot of these operas, the productions around a lot of these operas are just really, really way too overthought. But um, mm -hmm. um, that's, that, that's how I view them. Uh, well, so before we get to the ring, you anticipate a question I was going to go to anyway. If you know these roles within you, you come to understand them as musical phenomena, the words, the men themselves, and then you enter into productions all around the world with these many different styles and approaches. And, you know, let's say in Singapore, for example, where there might be a more traditional conservative audience or playing it in parts of the world that are socially or politically, morally, let's call it conservative as opposed to playing it in more open places like Berlin, New York, Sydney, maybe London, maybe others. Um, how does that affect your approach to your performance? It, oh, it doesn't. I am there to, perform, to sing the music and to fit into the director's concept. Mm -hmm. I'm not someone who digs my heels in against what we're faced with in terms of a production, because even if I don't like it, that's none of my business. Um, I have to fit into the big picture. Otherwise, I'm the one who looks like a, a fool. Mm -hmm. If I'm trying to do my own performance, it doesn't work. Uh, even if the bigger picture is not a pretty one, I still have to fit in. Um, and in that way, I'm just very pragmatic about my job. And do you think that your approach, which I'm not disagreeing with, is more representative of opera singers now. I will give you the example of an Australian who I work with a lot, Joan Sutherland, who arrived with her own costumes, no matter what the production looked like. 
she had her own costumes and her own wigs for Anna Bolena, for Lucia, for Norma, and so forth, that she wore anywhere in the world. Yeah, I'm not sure that would have been done without pre-discussion, mind mm-hmm. you. She was Joan Sutherland, and yeah. she she was the biggest opera star in the world of her time, arguably, along with Birgit Nilsson. Mm-hmm. And they could do what they wanted. Did but you I'm ever sure meet? Those yeah. two ladies were very, very practical. I'm sure they were not having either tantrums about that. That was all pre-discussed, I, I have no doubt. Yeah. I agree with you. In my experience with both of them, they knew what they wanted, but they were not headstrong, they were not difficult, and they wanted the production to work whatever production they were in. Oh, yes, and they didn't want to be involved in a, a failure, and they knew what was they knew what worked best for them, mm-hmm. and they knew that that would work best for everybody. Yeah. I have Did no doubt. Did you ever meet Joan Sutherland and or Richard Bonning? And many, his- many times socially and yeah. once professionally early on I was a supernumerary in the daughter of the regiment at the Australian <laughs> Opera as then it was that was it was then called in 1986 I was just in the background mm-hmm. and Joan was there or Dame Joan um, yeah. we were friendly but not friends so I'll refer to her properly Dame Joan um and um she was very fun in the rehearsals and down to earth as everyone knows and she was saying well this is really like the grandmother of the regiment isn't it so, <laughs> because I think by then she was oh 60 I'm going yeah, to say I think 60 born in 26 or or 27 so in November right around now yeah in 27 was it yeah 26 she, or 20. she was 59 years old and yeah. she was the grandmother of the regiment and mm-hmm. you know it was fun Richard was uh, conducting that as yeah. well um, although as a super I didn't have anything to do with him but I knew them of course I was a yeah. uh, an up and coming young singer at the time winning all the competitions etc and we all they all knew of my existence although I was still at that time 21 years old and an upstart so mm-hmm. so <laughs> I have been to 75 countries in the world, and I've worked in a lot of them. I have never been to Australia. And the reason for that very simply was I was supposed to work at the Australian Opera in the fall of 2001. And then I was supposed to lecture in Adelaide, do wine tastings in Melbourne, do a film in Perth, visit Kangaroo Island. I had three months of Australia scheduled, but we here in New York had our 9-11. And Ah. I decided that it was important to stay here. We were all needed at that time. And it broke my heart because Australia was and is my number one country to visit that I've not been to. But when I go there, I want to really go there and spend a lot of time there. So although I've never been, I have many, many friends there, and I know a lot about the country through them. Um, I'm going to start right now with Brisbane, where you are because I do have several friends in Brisbane. I'm going to have them all go to the opera there. Uh, My understanding of Brisbane is a very sport-oriented city, very beautiful, almost tropical compared to the colder cities further south. Not the Sydney is cold, but colder. Melbourne, more temperate. Adelaide, more temperate. Um, Tell me about Brisbane and about its preparations for this production of the Ring Cycle that's coming starting December 1st. Oh, okay. Um, when you say Brisbane is a tropical city, uh, you shouldn't be under any misapprehension that there's, it's full of palm trees and everything. It's no. a, it, it's a proper looking city, mm-hmm. uh, but, but it, the weather is more tropical. It's more a little bit more like Florida yeah. in terms of uh, the temperatures and the humidity. And you can get all that lushness outside the city, absolutely, not very mm-hmm. far away. But the city itself is a functioning city of many millions of people. Um, The the Brisbane preparations for the ring, we we rehearsed in Sydney for six weeks first. And then we came up here three weeks ago to begin the load in and the technical rehearsals. So we have just completed uh, or are completing our piano dress rehearsal cycle Mm -hmm. this week. 
Um, and then on Monday, we begin the stage orchestral cycle. And then the following week is the final dress rehearsals. And then we do the shows. Um, so everything was prepared in Sydney. And concurrent to the studio rehearsals in Sydney, I'm, I'm skipping over the Brisbane part because we kind of just slotting into the theatre. There's not really any preparation here. There's a few touch-up rehearsals, mm -hmm. but that's it. Just a reminder, brush-ups. All the work was done in Sydney. And in fact, this was supposed to have happened in 2020. So the production team had done everything three years ago, actually. Mm -hmm. And then again in 2021, everything was set up, ready to go, and we had to close down right after rehearsals were supposed to have begun. So they've all been ready for a long time, as have I. Um, mm -hmm. So we're just all bursting to get it on. But the prep rehearsals were in Sydney, and they had another theatre in Western Sydney where they did all the teching with mm -hmm. uh, your audience may or may not be aware that this is a, a very techni technology-based production with 16 giant LED screens, which are all choreographed to fly in and out and spin and make rooms, mm -hmm. um, projections on them, etc. with combined with very, very large scenic pieces that slide into the middle of these walls. And that takes a lot of time to coordinate. So they had a whole other theater in Western Sydney where they were doing that for six weeks while we did the blocking, etc. And we've all brought that together here in Brisbane in the last three weeks. Mm -hmm. And now uh, we've done the piano dresses and we're on our way. Um, because I know, because I've been told by people there that uh, the latest in video content creation techniques and audio visual and light equipment, that it will be very tech driven, but I don't imagine that it will be tech dominated is my feeling. I think the music first, um, audiences may in Brisbane may have never seen a ring cycle before. And I know they've been done in Australia, certainly, but not perhaps in Brisbane. Um, but it's, I'm wondering in rehearsal, have you or will you be looking at the visuals a lot, not oh. during performance, but a lot during, I mean, for example, I'm just speaking out of my head, but if a rainbow bridge is created or if a, a dragon appears or a snake or a frog or any of the many things that happen in the ring cycle, will you have a visual knowledge of what is happening or is it no. that for the audience to know and not you? We weren't privy to any of that in the blocking rehearsals. Mm -hmm. Therefore, a lot of it to us felt empty. Mm -hmm. And don't worry, don't worry. There's a lot happening around you. And we said, well, what? And they said, you'll see. And, uh, <laughs> but so in the rehearsals, I've been turning around a lot and having a look at what's going on because mm -hmm. I'd like to know. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, so I broke character many, you know, their rehearsals, it's fine. I broke character many times and just turned around and had a look at what was happening on the screens. And some of it's amazing, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, before we get to Votan, which is the role you're playing, in other words, the big god, dad, the boss. Um, yeah. I know you've played Hunding, you've played Fasold, you've played Fafter, you've played Hagen, you've played... Anyone else I've left out in in the various ring uh, operas? That's all I've done. That's all. Okay. So the reason I raise that is you've been in many ring opera performances around the world, and you have seen numerous votants, and you have studied the music and know the story. I've you know that's for certain. How long has Votan been in you, in effect, gestating? for the Votan that you are now going to be Daniel's Votan starting okay. on December 1st. When I began um, learning to sing with my first main mentor, I wasn't my first teacher, but my first main mentor, he said, you will be a Wagner singer. He said, you won't be a Wagner singer for a long time, but you will sing Wagner. So you should start looking at all this music and just getting acquainted with it. 
Now, as a young man, that's a lot when you're still actually learning how to sing and putting all the bits together that you need to even be a competent professional. So it was just there in the back of my head. But one of the first singing competitions I was successful in, I was only a finalist, but it was one of the larger competitions here. I sang Dalant's aria from Flying Dutchman. And it was received very positively. So my teacher was right. Now, let's skip ahead a few years when I was already a professional. Um, you're, you're speaking of Votan specifically, I know. Yes. But but it but it's a process. My first big my first Wagner role. No, no, not my first Wagner role. I had done my first Wagner roles as an Adler Fellow at San Francisco, San Francisco Opera. But my first big Wagner role uh, outside of that sphere was Hagen which I was offered at 29 years old to perform when I was 32 years old. Mm. I'm 58 now. So it's a long time ago. Mm -hmm. 1998, we did mm -hmm. that in Adelaide. Um, and that went very, very well. So much so that the conductor Jeffrey Tate brought me to Cologne to do the new um, Goethe Dammerung there with Robert Carson, et cetera, et cetera. And the years go by. 2010 was my first opportunity with Votan when I covered uh, the LA Opera production by Achim Freyer. Now, I was only given seven months' notice to learn all three roles, which I did, but it was under duress and I was still carrying on the rest of my career. And let's just say, if I'd had to go on, I'm not sure what would have happened. I did, in fact, do the dress rehearsal of Siegfried, uh, which was scheduled. It wasn't an accident. The, the, the guy I was covering, which was Vitali Kovalyov, mm -hmm. uh, was not able to do that. the schedule they laid out. So I did the Siegfried dress rehearsal for him. And that went pretty well. Not perfect, of course, because I had no proper rehearsal except in the studio. Mm -hmm. And here I was being thrown onto this treacherous set, which everyone which in the I business. Saw. I went to that cycle. Yeah. It's a, it was a large the... disc and very, very diagonal, very <laughs> practically vertical. It was just simply dangerous. Yeah. And people hurt themselves. And yeah. so here I was going onto that with no prior. Well, they let me have a quick walk around beforehand, but, you know. That doesn't help you when you have to sing a new Wagner role with 80 or 90 people in the pit with James Conlon and wonderful colleagues such as John Trelevin, uh, who else was in that? Graham Clark. Yeah. The best, you know, yeah. Linda Watson. Yeah. And all me. So that happened. And then nothing really came from that. So. I kept doing my base components of the ring cycles all over the place, like in Seattle, et cetera, and Tokyo. Yeah. And uh, and I was supposed to be in 2020, in fact, for the Opera Australia one, Faz Um, And then the pandemic happened. And I was around Australia at, for the pandemic because a lot of my contracts were in Australia. Mm -hmm. And they got shut down one by one. Um, and because I was here, I had a lot of time to be with my opera community, even though a lot of it was in lockdown. Not all of it was. And I was continuing my coachings, etc. cetera, uh, luckily. Mm -hmm. And the uh, artistic director of the opera uh, said, why don't you work work that up, work Votan up for me and I'll hear it. So I did. And I, in fact, basically did two rounds of auditions. I didn't, I wasn't, it, despite my 32 year long career at the time, I was not handed the role by any means. Mm -hmm. And Opera Australia, uh, although it's an Australian opera company, could at the time, or still can, but doesn't anymore, could at the time have any artist it wanted in the world. It had the budget. So I was not handed the role by any means. I auditioned twice and they gave it to me. Um, and so here we are, I was supposed to do it in 2021 as Votan. 
and I worked on it diligently with that in mind. And uh, we were shut down. And then here we are two years later again, and we're finally doing it. That's my Votan journey in a nutshell. So given that he could gestate in you for a very long time, yes. in, for all the reasons you just enumerated, how do you feel about him? I'm not about singing him, but about this man that you've come to know and studied who is so complex. He is about everything. He is the one who is the lawgiver, the lawbreaker, the one who is a profoundly feeling father who is trapped by by law in some ways and sees his daughter going outside the law and he understands the freedom that she represents he goes out. He goes outside the law, which he broke. Yes, well, he uh, breaks the laws. He has his staff, and everything's written on the staff. But um, his wife Fricka takes him to task rather severely, and with every production that one sees of of Ryan Gold and Dee Valkyra, this dynamic of that couple sets the tone for so much of what follows. And even though yeah. Votan does not appear in Got to Damarong, he might as well be. Yes. There because his the echoes of everything that he did or did not do resonate for the next sixteen hours. Well, yes, and it is his grandson who who is carrying on his story. So Siegfried, yeah. Yeah. And so this because of the pandemic and because of the delayed start. How have you grown or lived with Votan in, in the absence of playing him where otherwise you might have before? Oh, I have to be very honest with you. During the intervening two years, it, it didn't. I, I, it came to me in the rehearsals more and more, actually. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, although they said they were going to do it in 2023, we didn't quite actually ever believe it until it happened. So... <laughs> And the way the opera here it set up their contracting in mm. the in the intervening times to deal with cancellations, etc., uh, they still could have pulled the plug at any time. I knew they wouldn't because they'd invested so much money into it, yeah. but they could have pulled the plug at any time. So we didn't quite believe it until it happened. So I did not give it too much weight, honestly, until I was really, really, truly doing it. I want to point out to listeners that the website is opera.org.au forward slash Brisbane forward slash ring hyphen cycle forward slash. And it is about to be summer in Australia. And I noticed yep. that the last got to Damarung because the dates are Rheingold, December 1, 8, 15, Valkyra, December 3, 10, 17, Siegfried, December 5, 12, 19, got to Damarung, December 7, 14, 21, that the last got to Damarung is the first day of summer in Australia. Yes. And I don't know how this production is going to end. I don't, you don't have to tell me. You may not have seen it. But given that got to Damarung in many productions is about renewal or about a restart or about a new way of living, no matter what the production is. I find it very interesting that Wagner, who was so pictorial about seasons, about time, um, that spring is very much evoked in Valkyra, that you in Australia will happen to be at the threshold of summer at that time. Um, I, I would love to be there, obviously. But the I guess what I'm trying to fasten on is playing it in, in the summer or playing in the very late spring. And does that have an impact in terms of the roles? I've seen so many ring productions that tend to be in colder weather at colder times of the year, uh, in a January in Vienna, that kind of thing. Yes. And are what's the weather like today, for example, in these well, days? I'm looking out the window and it's yeah. uh, overcast and drizzly. All right. Uh, 23 degrees Celsius. Okay, which is a beautiful temperature, 73 Fahrenheit. But I guess what I'm wondering about is because the setting in Brisbane is 
unusual because although the ring has been done in Australia, it is not something that's done all the time. Um, what's the buzz? What's the feeling around it? You have an international cast, but with many, many Australians. And have you had a sense in the city of what, in Brisbane, of what people are feeling? Is there a discussion in Sydney and Melbourne? Uh, I, I can't really answer you because okay. when you do a role like Votan, you go into Wagner jail and you just have to sequester yourself and reserve all your energy, conserve all your energy. Um, I'm not out at all. Uh, I go to rehearsals and then I come back to the apartment. Um, and whatever socializing we've done has just been amongst ourselves. So I, I really cannot answer that in any way. Well, if I may, because you mentioned someone I admire greatly, Graham Clark, who sang Mima, who died not too long ago. Would you talk about him? He was a he was a very fit man, apart from being a wonderful singer, he was a tenor. He was fantastically in good shape, even in his later years. And his agility was a big part of his performance style. Yes. But he was also a much loved colleague. And since you mentioned him, I, I would like to go back and talk about him. Oh, all right. Uh, I'll briefly, I mean, I had several interactions with him over the years. And uh, in a nutshell, what I can say about him is that he is really one of two or three people I could name who were among the nicest people I've ever met in this business. Mm -hmm. And I've met hundreds. And I could name the, I could name the other two, but I won't. All right, I'll name them. One is Federico von Stader, yes, who is delightful. And the yes. other one is my colleague here um, in our production, actually, singing my old roles, Andrea Silvestrelli. I don't know if you've come across him. I have. I've heard him a lot in San Francisco. He He's Italian, he, but he does a lot of Wagner. Well, that's, that's on account of his uh, freak of nature voice. Yeah. There's no way to put it. He, along... They're the three people I could pinpoint immediately as being mm -hmm. some of the nicest people you could ever meet in this business. And Graham Clark was, um, I'd first met him on my first trip to New York in 1989. He was mm -hmm. in a production of Die Frau und der Schatten at the Met. Yeah. And it's a long story how I got to be hanging around there as a nobody. Uh, but I met Donald McIntyre. I met James King. I met Graham Clark. Yeah. Uh, and they were all actually really nice, but Graham Clark just stood out and he was so kind to this young singer, uh, he and his wife at the time. Um, I'm not sure if it was the same wife who uh, was is now his widow because I believe both his wives were called Joan. Um, so I don't know which one it was at the time, honestly. But in 2010, I think it was the same lady. Mm -hmm. In 2010, when I worked with him, he was... Nothing had changed, absolutely. Um, you were talking about Andreas Silvestrelli's, let's call it freakish voice. Wagner voices are particular. We tend to think of the other end of the spectrum, the, the sopranos and the tenors and, and the struggles or the exaltations they have. But at the very deep end where you reside, where Silvestrelli resides, that's a whole world of wonderful the the men I've known who have sung those roles tend to be wonderful guys. I've never had a problem with anyone, not a Votan, not any of those guys. Even Hundings off the stage tend to be a lot sweeter than they are on the stage. <laughs> and Hoggins. But um this is what I referred to earlier, that there tends to be, in my experience, a sort of fraternity of Wagner singers and a respect and a great regard for one another in ways that one does not always find in other repertory. That, that's and, true. Yeah. And it's something I really love about being in the sphere of Wagner performances, that the solidarity, the supportiveness, the willingness to step in and, and to help one another, 
I'm not saying that if you're in a bel canto opera that it's all people at each other's throats, but it's a very different aesthetic. It's a very different feeling backstage. I'm not talking about as an audience member. I'm talking about backstage. Well, I, I think it's basically can boil that down to that there's a lot of humor amongst us in the rehearsal mm -hmm. room and generally because what we're doing is so serious. So <laughs> whereas with the, uh, let's say, the Italian wing of our genre, their stuff is much brighter and happier, even though it's all death and incest as well. Um, the music is much more jovial. And mm -hmm. I don't know, a lot of those stars and oh, a lot of those practitioners of the Italian operas, there's a lot of diva antics going on backstage with mm -hmm. those guys that doesn't happen with the Wagner productions. Yeah. Why is that? Uh, I am not a doctor or a psychiatrist, so I can't <laughs> answer you. But I would say it's... Uh, honestly, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. We're all privileged to do this for a living. Um, and I just think what the Wagner people do is a little bit extra hard, really, just because of the length. Yeah. So I just think we have a, a lot more sympathy for each other. Mm -hmm. Yes, and empathy. Now, I know that you have, as every singer I've ever known or worked with has declared, particular affection for certain theaters, houses, cities, and so on. And I associate you a fair amount with San Francisco, with Seattle, and to some degree with Minnesota, in other words, Minneapolis and St. Paul. Um, as theaters that you found congenial. Am I correct in that? You are correct. Yeah. Particularly Seattle and uh, Minnesota. Mm -hmm. um, I only worked three times in Minnesota, but that was a lovely, lovely company to work for. Yeah. Um, because of the leadership at the time, mm -hmm. which is uh, Dale Johnson. Um, no, that's right. And... Um, and his and his casting guy Floyd um, uh, in Seattle. Well, Spade Jenkins was like old time uh, movie empresario that you see in those classic golden age movies, wasn't he? Yeah. Um, hands on, cared deeply. Not all his decisions were great. Most of them were came together very well, but some of them were a little bit out there. But generally speaking, he ran a great company that was revered around the world. Um, yes, my, my time at San Francisco was more as a young artist, and I've been there several times since, but it has not been on my uh circuit, as it were. Mm -hmm. Um, but um, definitely a great opera house and where I really formed me. Yeah, I was, I've only worked or been involved in a production once in Seattle at the very end of the last century, 1999. It was a production of Lohengrin. Jane Eaglin was uh, Elsa, as I recall. And what struck me, because I had come from the Metropolitan Opera where we dressed up in rehearsals and we, the managers wore ties and coats and jackets and so on. Um, the Spade Jenkins, who was the head of the company, wore a white T-shirt every day in rehearsal. And there was a casualness, which is not to say a lack of care, but the whole approach was so visibly different from the rather formal Met. The Met has evolved, but the Met still has a formality that I don't dislike. I kind of like it, actually. But it struck me to be in that other environment in Seattle where very serious work was being done. But the flavor was different. Yes. Intriguing to me for that. Uh, Spate basically had an extended family, and they came to play all year long with him. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what it felt like. Um, please tell me about your exposure to opera initially. You grew up in Sydney. Um, Australia has produced great stars for a long time, but most of them have traveled abroad for their careers, as you have. As I said when I was preparing for this conversation, You've been almost everywhere. You've sung almost everywhere. Buenos Aires, just you name it. You Stuttgart, 
it seems like you've been there, Singapore. Um, but what was your initial attraction and, and involvement with opera in Australia? Well, uh, initially it wasn't opera, it was theatre that was attractive to me uh, since five years old. Mm -hmm. When I was five, I was taken by my mum to some kids' show uh, and it was for my birthday and all the birthday kids were invited on stage to take part in something uh, <laughs> which involved creating stage effects, etc. And from that second, I was hooked and I knew what I wanted to do with my life. Mm. Now, I never knew how I was going to get there. Um, and during uh, high school, initially primary school, then high school, I was involved with school musicals. And this was great fun. And during high school, I wanted to do more of that. So I went outside of the school environment to do that at the local amateur theater societies. Mm -hmm. So I was doing a lot of musicals. And musicals is what I really love the best. It's what brought me to opera. Opera is just really aggrandized musical comedy, isn't it? Well, musical tragedy in many, <laughs> <laughs> in many cases. <clears throat> Um, but it's it's all music theater. Yeah. Uh, so um, during that process, I realized I needed to get better and I needed to be better to do better. So I got a singing teacher and at, concurrently, the high school I was at had a fantastic music department and uh, we'd been exposed to opera during the elective music classes and um I went, my first opera was, I took myself to the Australian opera on a student rush ticket to see Cosi Fan Tutte, mm -hmm. of all things. Um, and I really enjoyed the experience. Now, I can't say Cosi Fan Tutte changed my life, but what did change my life was a prior experience where having heard excerpts of Boris Godunov in music class with all the bells, et cetera, at the coronation scene, we were taken to see... we. I think it was only one act as it transpired, but we saw one act of um, Janáček's Yenufa mm -hmm. performed by the Australian Opera at a dress rehearsal. And that was amazing. But that was prior to Cosi Fun to a It's because of that that I went and got a student rush ticket. Mm -hmm. And I think they, they were so cheap uh, that it, I, I was able to do that. And um, I, I did more and more of that. But at the same time as that, I was doing my singing competitions and doing very well in them. So that it sort of evolved and that I was able to actually take part in it as a supernumerary. I got a job as an usher at the Sydney Opera House, which is, the Sydney Opera House is not Opera Australia. Sydney Opera House is like Carnegie Hall, say. It's a whole function and the opera hires it. So as an usher, I was not Opera Australia's employee. I was, but I was there every day seeing operas and ballets as a young guy. And um, so I was doing, uh, I was a super at the opera. I was also helping run their super titles, which mm -hmm. back then were done on slide machines. <laughs> um, so it was really uh, manual labor. You had to have a score with the markings in it where you had to change the slide literally like that. We had a backup slide machine. Um, and so I learned a lot about what not to do rather than what to do uh, just by listening to really an extraordinary amount of ordinary performances. <laughs> and <laughs> so um, that was that was my lead in to being becoming an opera singer. And then yeah. I got early contracts. Um, the first one actually was here in Brisbane. So this is a full circle moment for me yeah. because my solo debut was here in Brisbane as a result of winning a contract in the Australian singing competition to perform at the Lyric Opera of Queensland. And the job was for me to sing the role of Joe in a concert performance of Showboat <laughs> in an outdoor performance right where we are performing now on the, what was the river, called the River Stage at World Expo 88. So it was a very big event. Mm -hmm. um, and that was my professional debut. So bravo for coming full circle which is Thanks. really what the ring is about. Yes. 
the good way for us to conclude because I know that your time is limited and and you have a lot in front of you. But Daniel Sumed, you you know we I've heard you many 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 times in many places. I've never had the occasion to speak with you, so it was a real pleasure to do so. And I know that you're coming to New York soon, and I hope oh, to actually in person. I live in New York, actually. You live, I live. New York, okay. you live in New York. It's so, 1997. So you have no excuse. <laughs> but actually, I would lo- look forward to meeting you and continuing our conversation. And I thank you. And as people say in opera, toy, 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 to you, you and your castmates and to people doing the production of Dering des Nibelungen at Australian Opera, or is it Opera Australia? Forgive me. Starting oh. December 1st in Brisbane through December 21st. And if I could be there, I certainly would be there. So, Daniel, thank you so much. Thank you for this opportunity and nice to have met you over the airwaves. Yeah. See you soon. <laughs>